five, four, three, two, live. Welcome to our Facebook Live interview with Mary Simpson. I'm Susan Shapiro Barish. I am the author of nonfiction books and I write fiction under my pen name, Susanna Marin. I'm so happy to be here today with Mary, whose new book has just come out, The Wedding Thief, quite a title, a wonderful, wonderful read. And our event is sponsored today by Book Trip, the leading source for book news and reviews. So Mary, here you are uh, right. with your quintessential summer read as you take a look at the complexity of female relationships and bonds, particularly two sisters and their mother. Your previous novels have been described as rich and layered with subplot, picturesque settings and genuine characters. I know that you were an attorney before you became a full-time author. And here we are with your third novel, Just Out. In this novel, you take on one of the most complicated bonds, and that is really the sister, the sister bond. The idea that a wedding is sacred. No spoiler here, but the book is called The Wedding Thief. So we have a sacred ceremony, something women really aspire to dream of get very jealous over the idea of a perfect wedding. And you put into gear two very emotional sisters who are very different. Marielle, the younger sister, is marrying her older sister, Sarah, who's the narrator of your story. She's marrying her ex-boyfriend. So let's start with the idea that your book is particularly inviting because you draw on humor and drama at the same time. So tell us about the inspiration for such a story that has both qualities. Well, I wanna say first, thank you for having me book trip and it's great to have you, Susan. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, the inspiration came from a couple of different things. One was a, a, an event that I was at where everyone got a little um, box at their place setting at the table. It was kind of a party favor type of thing. And it was a box of conversation starters. And um, I happened to pull one out at the time and just read it. And it said, would you rather be the smartest person in the room or the best looking? And I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting question. So I think I sort of just stored it away in the back of my mind for possible future use. And then some years later, uh, I, you know, I, I combined that with the notion of two very competitive sisters, um, one who would be the sort of the so-called brainy one and one who would be the beautiful one, although of course it's never that simple, um, and then threw in a guy who they were both in love with and decided to stir that up and, and that's what happens. Well, what we have is really pretty tricky because you've created a sister who's hell-bent on destroying her sister's wedding and that's not for the fainter part. So what made you decide to write it in Sarah's voice, the older sister's voice? Well, I, you know, I always wanted to write it in Sarah's voice. I really never thought about uh, anyone else being the narrator. And I think because she considers herself as the victim in this case, um, 18 months before the story begins, uh, she finds out that Marielle, her younger sister, it has got something going on with Carter, uh, Sarah's boyfriend, and they've just kind of begun to see each other and hadn't talked to Sarah about it yet because he hadn't found the right time, uh, as if there ever is one. But um, so, you know, they haven't spoken in 18 months and Sarah feels, you know, she's, she feels aggrieved. Um, her younger sister has stolen her man and I, I just thought, you know, I wanted to do it from her standpoint, but with a lot of humor, as you mentioned before. I love, you know, having funny things happen to my characters. Uh, one reviewer called one of my books cringeworthy, I think, um, you know, because, she, you know, in a, in a good way, because she said she was cringing and laughing at the same time. So I like to put them in difficult situations. Uh, and I thought having it from Sarah's viewpoint would allow me to really do that. So when you plotted the novel, and we'd love to hear how you write, do, do you have the entire plot in mind? I know you had the theme in mind because 
of the party you were at with the, you know, with the party favor. Yeah. But did, did you, I mean, did you have this specific storyline from the get-go or did you just take two competitive sisters and ask yourself what you would do with that? I think it was, it's more the latter. Um, I'm not really a, an outliner per se. Mm -hmm. I don't have the kind of brain that can dream up, you know, an entire story uh, from beginning to end. I, I write a chapter at a time and then I do an outline as I go along, a little thumbnail outline to remind myself of who, what the chapter was about, who was in it, where it took place. So I kind of have a roadmap of where I've been, which is very helpful because it's like, you know, as, a, as an author, as you get farther and farther into a book, there's all this stuff you have to keep in your head. What happened when and who was in the scene? And I color code it so that I know what characters were in the scene. But the, the, other, the other thing I do is I use a lot of visuals. I'm a very visual person. I love taking photographs. And I can I do a little show and tell here? We would love that. Okay, so I, I have a whole idea board, which is also, um, I think I've showed it on Instagram or my website or whatever, but some of the photos that, that um, I, I searched for and took to give me inspiration where I'll just show you a few. This one, wait, can you, can you see it? it up and back, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so this is a picture of a, of a house in Litchfield County, Connecticut which is an area that I used as inspiration for the fictional town of Hampstead. And I used this as kind of a drop, you know, a foundation for the Harrington family home, the house that Sarah and her sister Marielle come back to two weeks before Marielle's wedding. And, you know, Sarah gets into all kinds of trouble and crazy things. Um, it was once owned by the actor Dennis Leary and his wife. They lived there for a number of years. It's a charming house. It's beautiful. It really is. Um, quickly, this is, there are two horses in the story. This is the barn. Right. Um, I remember that scene in your yeah, book. Yeah. There's um, the night that um, Sarah first comes back to Hampstead because her mother has summoned her home, telling her she's very ill. Sarah goes and stays at an inn because she's mad at her mother and she's not about to stay in the house. And this is a, a picture that I found of an inn in Connecticut, a room that I thought was really pretty. So I used well, that. that. Yep. Well, that since works. you just showed us the pictures, yep. let's talk about the mother because okay. she's a very important character in the book. Yeah. And I really loved her, that she had so much agency, that she was a real character of her own. And her, I mean, just her whole personality came through. You did a great job with that. Thank so you. So she's very determined for her daughters to reconcile. And for anyone who's watching who's a sister, a mother, a daughter, we all know what that's like. The idea of feuding siblings is really uncomfortable for a mother. So she she suggests to Sarah that she comp that she considers a compromise. And what makes Sarah feel so righteous about anything but a compromise, without spoiling the story? Yeah, no, Sarah. Sarah just Sarah doesn't want to compromise at all. Sarah, you know, she she just sees herself as the victim here. And, um, you know, she thinks it's all Marielle's fault. And she, you know, she doesn't want to do anything to meet Marielle halfway. Um, in the beginning of the book, again, I'm not giving away any secrets, Marielle asks Sarah to be a stand-in bridesmaid for a friend of Marielle's who can't make it because she broke a leg or something. And that almost sends Sarah, you know, off the roof. But that's the kind of thing that the mother is saying, oh, you know, you, you should do this. You should, you know, be the bridesmaid. Oh, and you're an event planner. And she's planned her own wedding, but you know, it's it's been really tough for her. So could you just take over for these last couple of weeks? That would be great. You're so smart, Sarah, you know how to do this. You know, she's just, she's trying to play on Sarah's, you know, whatever vulnerabilities she has uh, and her pride at being a good event planner. But, you know, Sarah just sees it as, Nope, you know, it's 100% Muriel's fault. And she's not willing to see that she might have had some, uh, something to do with what's happened. Yeah, and I think that the mother really embodies 
again, as I was saying, what so many mothers feel, you know, can't you see it this way? Talking yeah. to a child who doesn't. And so, but we really are inside Sarah's head and we yeah. understand the injury. Let's talk for a moment about romantic love mm -hmm. because, you know, what, what could be better than the day that you get married to the love of your life. And that's what we're raised to believe. And we right. hope to believe, we want to believe in it. So what do you believe, Mary, in order to have had such a, you know, such an incendiary story as two sisters, one man? It's quite a triangle. What do I believe in romantic love? That, yeah. I believe that we sometimes can fool ourselves about it. Um, you know, I'm trying to relate to this, the story here. I believe that we can have certain thoughts about what we think it is. And those thoughts may be different from reality. And I think sometimes we need to let our hair down a little and be a little more accepting of possibilities that come outside of our little realm of, you know, our own life. We have to be, I think, more open-minded than we sometimes are. Like people might have in mind I want a man who's this, 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 and that. And that may not be what comes along. And you have to sort of say, okay, I'm ready to take a chance here. And I think Sarah is, she's thinking, you know, this is who I loved. This is who I do love. You know, he's all these qualities. He's all these things. And she's, you know, she's just going down this road where she's determined to get him back without sort of letting herself maybe live the rest of her life, you know, be open to things. Well, I, I think that one of the best parts of this story is that we really go with Sarah for the journey. Yeah. And it really is a journey. It's, it's about a young woman really being honest with herself, which isn't always so easy. And right. you know, before we talk about your craft a little, which I really want to, I, I don't know if you mentioned, but your first novel, which this is so incredible, became a Hallmark television movie. So how did that, you know, what was that like, your first novel? It was surreal in a, in a, in a great way. It was one of the most amazing things that's ever happened in my life to have that happen. And I got to go to, um, I flew out to Vancouver and I spent two days on the set at some little towns around Vancouver that um, the production company was using um, as a substitute for Maine. The book takes place in a, another fictional town in Beacon, Maine. And I, you know, I met everybody. I got to listen with, you know, headphones. I got to stand right next to the director and look at the A camera and the B camera monitors and you know, just, and everyone was so nice and everyone was so excited for me. They kept saying, what does it feel like to see your characters come to life? And I said, I mean, it's giving me goosebumps now just talking about it. It was two of the best days I've ever, ever had. And it was it's amazing. It's a writer's dream. Isn't it's it? a dream. It's really a yeah. writer's dream to see the story on the screen. Yeah, it so is. tell us a little of, I know you said that you don't really outline, but do you, People are always curious, do you write every day? Do you get to write at the same time? Uh, no and no. <laughs> um, and I don't outline, but I should have mentioned this before. I, but as you said, I had the major theme of the book in mind, the kind of, the, you know, the rough idea. And I had the major plot points, like at this point, this will happen. Halfway through, this will happen. And I remember talking to my editor about it and kind of sketching out the beginning and the end and then saying, and then I just have to fill in, you know, the 300 little pesky pages in the middle. Um, because sometimes that's all you're starting with, you know, as you know, you, you've got your beginning and you have a few ideas, but so much of it comes for me as I write and, um, and I have to kind of let it happen. And now I think I've forgotten your question. You're asking me about the no, process. No, I was asking about oh, do the yeah, do I write every day? Writing goes every day. I try to write every day, but I sometimes life gets in the way and I just, you know, I have like piles of other things I have to do, but I try to write every day. And when I don't, you know, I don't beat myself up about it because it's just the way it is. But I, I make up for that on other days where I just sit there and pound the keyboard for hour after hour and get a lot done. Um, who, there, was a fa there was a famous writer, probably more than one, who said, um, something like 
you know, I like to write, but I love having written. And that's kind of that's how I, what I identify with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You feel good once you better once you've done it than when you're at it. Well, what about your book tour? I mean, here we are in the pandemic and we're hearing that people are reading more and more, but what is your virtual book tour looking like? Well, I, you know, I'm excited about it. At first I was really, of course, I think we all as authors are a little downhearted about not being able to go out and meet readers in person face to face because nothing, nothing can take the place of that. I mean, we write for our readers. If it weren't for our readers, we, you know, they're the inspiration. They're why we keep going. And the best thing of all is communicating with readers. When, and I will tell people, if you go to my website, there's an email link. If you want to write to me, I answer all my emails. I answer all my social media stuff, but I love getting emails. So to me, you know, it's not the best situation, but on the other hand, it still lets you communicate with your readers and people can link in from anywhere. You know, they can be anywhere in the country. They can be anywhere in the world. And at least I feel like I'm, I, I have the chance to, to reach out as much as possible in the age of COVID, as you say. So thank God we have this. Thank goodness for it. People are Zooming like crazy. Yeah. So do you have a project in mind for your next book? I do have a project in mind, and all I can really say about it is that it involves another female protagonist, because that's kind of who I relate to the best and like to write about. Um, there will be humor, there will be drama, and there will be love. Kind of my, my, which, my, all my main we're all themes. looking to read about. And, and while you were writing your book, did you actually surprise yourself? Did you, like... Did you find that you were sitting there understanding your characters and then finding something unusual within the character anyway? You know, there are writers who, so let me say it this way. Sometimes, because I go to a lot of writer events, a writer will say, oh, the characters just leave me. And others will say, no, I control my character. And so there are two schools of thought and I just wonder where you are about that. Yeah, I think it depends on the character, but I think for the most part, they kind of lead me, especially the mother. I always like to have like one really quirky sort of, well, this also had the former art teacher who was <laughs> very, who was quirky, but um, I think the mother led me the, you know, led me the most. She was kind of, I just sort of went with wherever she wanted to flow. And maybe part of me as a mother was coming out and maybe that was just some, I don't know, some, you know, some divine providence just <laughs> moving the, the keys on my keyboard. But I think I, I think the characters do sort of take me along for the ride, yeah. Well, that really brings us to another point that I would like to make about your novel, and that is that it's multi-generational. Oh, and that you. means that, you know, a young woman would read it and say, oh my goodness, I identify with this, I understand that. But so would a woman of any age, an older woman, and the mother, you know, we don't want to give her away, but she is so feisty and has such strong beliefs. Yeah. And, you know, in some ways, I guess she represents the more seasoned woman in being so strong-minded. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that comment about multi-generational because I've received so many emails and comments over the years from people who have said, you know, it'll be like a young, a young woman who reads the book and says, I love this and I'm getting a copy for my mom or, um, and my uh, grandmother. Yeah, and my grandmother, right. Or I was just going to say, or a grandmother who says I'm getting copies for my daughter and my granddaughter, or I've lent the, you know, loaned the book to them or whatever. And I, I love that. I love it. Well, there's so much to offer in this story. And I think that when I caught Sarah's story, the, the Sarah part of the book, a journey. It really is. And so you're underscoring what, what we go through as women, where we find ourselves in the circumstances that we're in. We really draw strength from it and we wake up so often. Yeah, exactly. And, and we find things about ourselves that, that we didn't know. Uh, and, and also find out that maybe there are things about ourselves that we need to tone down a little bit. Um, Sarah, had that, had that experience. She thinks she's right about everything and, you know, her way or the highway. And she finds out that that's, you know, that's something she needs to work on a little bit. 
Well, I, you know, I hope that everyone will pick up your book. I loved reading it. It's really food for thought, even though it's a very quick read. And Somewhere I'm so happy I, I that you came on copy. today. I have a copy here. Yeah, let's show it. everyone. It's, it's a great jacket. Thank you. You must, before we part, let's just talk about the title for one minute. Because okay. sometimes titles are just so on point. Yeah. And I wondered if you thought of the title and if it just came to you. I did think of it. It did come to me, but it wasn't my original title. I Well, I had a working title that I wasn't really that keen on, but it was what I was using. And it was called um, The Harrington Sisters Come Home. And it's okay. You know, I think it just sort of sits there. It describes a little bit about what's going on because they do come back to the fictional town of Hampstead, Connecticut. And there's also the, the metaphorical meaning that they need to come home and kind of, you know, get their relationship back on solid ground somehow. Um, but I was, I don't even remember how far along I was in the writing of the book, maybe halfway or so and I was just thinking about other titles and I came up with a wedding thief and I thought oh my gosh that that says it all and it's I think it's kind of people might be curious about it and it's got an air of sort of mystery like what's the wedding thief who is the wedding thief not if it's not somebody go around going around stealing things from weddings it's somebody actually trying to hijack the whole event no it's very visceral and it's really authentic. It really represents the book. So I just want to thank you and say it was great that we got to talk about it. And thank good luck you. with your tour. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. And I, I want to say thank you to Book Trib also for, for having me. Thank you, Book Trib.